Hi, thank you for that introduction. And I'm really sorry I can't be there in person, but I do actually have some symptoms at the moment, dare I say it. So my research group became concerned right back in 2020 at the naive way in which statistics were driving the COVID narrative. So in particular, we were concerned at the failure to consider causal explanations for differences in observed case and fatality data. Now, the, the problem is that, as Claire has already indicated, all of the metrics are driven by the definition of a COVID case. So obviously we've got the number of cases, which I might be one at the moment, the number of hospitalizations, number of deaths. And even if the definition of a case was something that everybody agreed with, the fact that we're not told any of the critical additional metrics namely how many of those cases are asymptomatic, how many of the hospitalizations are for something other than COVID or only got COVID after hospitalization, and similarly, how many of those died with COVID, not from COVID. So even if we, um, uh, even if we were agreed on what a COVID case was, we're never told those critical additional metrics. And of course, things are much worse. <clears throat> Because again, as uh, Claire's made clear, a, a COVID case we now know is simply just a positive PCR test. And so it can include all of these classes of people. Those would be the, the true positives, but we've also got the false positives. So those are the false positives. <clears throat> those are the true positives. And again, as Claire has indicated, there's some doubts about really whether those should be people who have the virus but never develop symptoms and test positive, whether they are actually true positives at all. Now, again, as Claire explained, there are multiple possible causes for false positives. And in particular for asymptomatic testing, which became increasingly widespread from the summer of 2020, this is really problematic. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about what false positives are. So just give us kind of like an explanation, a graphical explanation. Let's suppose that an asymptomatic person tests positive and there are, there's a 1% false positive rate, i.e. 1 in 100 people who don't have the virus would test positive. Now, most people assume that a person testing positive likely has the virus, but it actually all depends on the underlying infection rate. Suppose that that rate is one in a thousand. Let's imagine that we test 10,000 asymptomatic people. Then we know that about 10 of those really have the virus. And so let's assume that they test positive. But because of the 1% false positive rate, about 100 of those who don't have the virus will also test positive. So, so out of the 110 in total who test positive, only 10 actually has the virus. And so if you test positive, there's actually less than 10% chance that you have the virus, meaning that under these uh, assumptions, the vast majority of so-called asymptomatic cases are false positives. And in fact, in with some real data, we see exactly this kind of pattern. Now, up until December 2020, when I was frequently doing analyses based on the official case data, I was highlighting the problem of showing case number plots without taking account the number of tests performed. So I'd produce comparative plots like this. But of course, these plots don't factor in the false positives. So we started to look for other key indicators, the most obvious and easily available of which were the NHS dashboard data for COVID triages. And this is highly revealing. So this was from December. You can see that the triage data at the top shows the real epidemic last spring, but just a kind of like a normal autumn increase. And that's in stark contrast to what the case data, that simply the number of cases was showing, which was of course driven by a massive increase in number of people tested. And that difference has continued. You can see here, this was from the last time I looked at this, this was from May. And those are matched up, the top and the bottom are matched up in, in dates. And so actually, I, I thought it was, it's actually pointless to use the official case data for anything. In fact, in March, we also discovered that the Lighthouse Labs were classifying positive cases on the basis of a single target gene call when the WHO guidelines was a minimum of two. So that means that in some weeks, 
as many as 50% of all those classified as cases were by definition false positives. Now, all of these issues come to the fore when we look at the propaganda campaign mounted with this misleading data. This, this highly um, repeated one in three claim. Now, what is true is that when the virus is fairly widespread, around one in three people who test positive, that's as opposed to who have the virus, have no symptoms. But so what? To show how ludicrous that is, if the virus was completely eliminated, this statement would have to say every person who has COVID-19 has no symptoms. And using data from a study of asymptomatics at Cambridge University, we were able to show how ludicrous the one in three claim is. So in six weeks over last winter, an average of about 5,000 asymptomatics were tested per week in pools of sizes about three to five. And uh, so there were in total 43 pools out of about 10 and a half thousand tested positive. But after confirmatory testing, just six of the 43 pools were found to be positive, and that was a single individual in each pool. So 36 out of the 10,000 or so pools te tested were false positives. And although that means the false positive rate was only about 0.35%, 84% of the positives were false. And of course, we don't even know if any of the six people who went on to develop, whether they actually went on to develop symptoms. And even if they did, we still can't be sure that they weren't also false positives because the confirmatory test was also a PCR test. So, so overall, um, on average, about one in 5,000 asymptomatics per week were confirmed positive at a time when the ONS was estimating that one in 120 people in Cambridge generally had the virus. Now, we showed that if the one in three claim was correct, then um, the ONS estimated infection rate would be over eight times greater than the true rate. And conversely, if the ONS infection rate is correct, then the maximum possible value for the proportion of people with the virus with no symptoms is one in 26 and not one in three as claimed. And finally, the problems with the PCR test also um, undermine the results of demonstrating vaccine effectiveness since it's the comparison between cases in vaccinated and unvaccinated that determine effectiveness. So in large observational trials such as this one, a flawed definition of a case is massively compounded by the fact that there are completely different testing strategies for the unvaccinated. Basically, asymptomatic unvaccinated people were tested regularly, while asymptomatic vaccinated people were not. So if you don't test the vaccinated, you won't find any cases among them. And if you continually test the unvaccinated, you'll find lots of cases, almost all false positives. Now, months on, the Lancet has still not, has still not published the, our rapid response letter highlighting the flaws in this study. So, what have the following questions got in common? How many COVID cases are there? How many COVID hospitalizations are there? How many COVID deaths are there? And how effective are the COVID vaccines? And the answer is that even after 17 months, we have no idea at all. Thank you.